Welcome everyone. My name is Mary Ma and I'm a member of the Kellogg Alumni Relations team. Thank you for joining us today for our series, This is Kellogg. This is the first event in our new series focused on entrepreneurship. Today's presentation will last about one hour. We encourage you to submit any questions for our speaker at any time via the Q&A icon on your screen. This program is being recorded and will be made available on Kellogg's YouTube channel. We will address audience questions towards the end of the program. And with that, I'm very happy to turn it over to Dean Francesca Cornelli to start our program. Hello, everyone. I am delighted to be back with our uh, This is Kellogg series. We've been showcasing uh, you know, our unique approach, how, what, what we are doing. And I'm delighted this quarter we are going to start, we are going to have a focus on entrepreneurship, which is a major focus actually at Kellogg. And I couldn't be happier to have the most amazing uh, speaker here with me to talk about entrepreneurship. Uh, I was telling her that I arrived to Kellogg and everybody immediately started to tell him, telling me, don't you know that uh, Christina Junqueira is a Kellogg graduate? So here she is talking to everybody. I just want to remind you in case you don't know, I'm sure you all already know that Christina is the co-founder of Nubank that is the largest independent bank in the world. And she's been the only Brazilian in the 2020 edition of Fortune's Most Powerful Women International, Fortune 40, under 40, uh, so many awards. Uh, uh, she's also the first woman to be featured pregnant on the cover of Brazilian business. She's an icon in entrepreneurship, but also as a woman and, and doing so much. So, Christina, welcome and thank you for being here with us. My pleasure. It's so nice to be back at Kellogg, although vir virtually. I'd, I'd say I, I would kill these days after over a year of a pandemic of the lake view, you know, and just walking through the campus. That, that would have been nice. Well, next we're time. looking forward to host you back. <laughs> <laughs> next time, next time. Yes. So I, let me start, and I want to remember, remind everybody, you can start uh, putting questions in the Q&A and I can uh, wave them in. But let me start with like a big question, right? Because you co-founded Nubank because you wanted to help change people's life, right? And in general right now what do you think are the biggest opportunities today for fintech to improve lives and also what did you focus specifically with new bank sure uh listen there's there's so much opportunity for for people to have impact uh within that space right it has already been measured the impact that for instance financial education or financial inclusion can have even on gdp and also on inequality indexes. So there's there's a lot that it can be done. Here at Newbank, we started primarily um, uh, from a place of outrage, like we couldn't stand uh, having to pay the highest interest rates in the world, some of the highest fees in the world, and have one of the worst customer experiences in the world. We were just very confident that using technology and design, we, we could find a way to do that differently and, and to show people that we didn't have to settle for that, like for that horrible, abusive relationship that people have with incumbent banks, still do, a lot of them. And over the years, we're now serving, it's been eight years, um, in the early May, it's gonna be eight years since we, we, we started the company, my partners and I. And we're now serving 37 million people. We've uh, saved uh, 20 billion highs in fees, that's roughly, FX is pretty bad these days, but something close to $4 billion uh, in fees that these people would have paid. And that's money that goes into education, that goes into healthcare, that goes into food and childcare and whatever it is, except for a bank's PL, you know? And in having access uh, to a, a platform that finally gives them control over their money, that finally shows them what the hell is happening with their finances and allows them to 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 take back control of their lives and to have dignity again is, is something very powerful that we believe is going to have lasting effect in all the all the deals that we we, we get into that we that we have the chance uh to have that type of impact 
So yeah, a lot can be done. That's amazing. And, and you know, that's also inspiration as I feel like sometimes people think you're going into finance uh, and, and as you show it, actually that sometimes an area where you can have the most impact because it makes so much of a difference to people. No, for sure. Like one of the things, I guess that speaks more to the developing markets than, than uh, the other way around. But one of the, my, my partner, David, he's our uh, CEO, our global CEO, he was talking to somebody the other day and I heard him say something that I totally agree. Um, is the difference between making, you know, the life of uh, uh, everyone, let's say in the US or in Europe, 5% uh, better, maybe, you know, 10% better versus, you know, making the lives of 70, 80% of people here 100% better, you know? So a lot can be done. Um, that's that's it. That's, in, it, that's really in, inspirational. Now, can we, let me ask you one thing, though. You, you have grown a lot also because of COVID-19, because, of course, people started moving more to digital. Hopefully, we will get out of this pandemic. And so how, what is there to stay? What is, uh, uh, what is going to change? What, what do you, how do you see the future? Yeah, so this has been seen across multiple industries, right? Like the the the, the famous five years in one, whatever. I, in some places could have been even ten years. Like we saw e-commerce penetration, um, a lot, just you know, delivery uh, uh, for food or groceries. Like a lot of those things really accelerated through the pandemic. And those are habits that are not coming back, right? Like people are not going to suddenly going to say, oh, now I'm going to go back to like wasting a, 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 an insane amount of time, you know, shopping uh, and, and, and driving to a store to then, you know, having to carry my stuff back. Like, no, they're just going to do that. I think Jeff Bezos was talking about the amount of time that Amazon has saved customers, right, over the years. An average store visit, when you count, like, you know, the driving um, from and to the store and the, you know, just picking up stuff and paying for it, et cetera, like it's an hour. And, and um, at Amazon, that's 15 minutes. So if you account for all those hours over the years, it amounts to so much. Um, so for sure, a lot of things are here to, say, to stay. When it comes to money, um, I don't know uh, how, it, how it is in the US, but at least in Brazil, we kind of always knew that money was something dirty, right? Like not dirty conceptually, but actually dirty, right? Like we used to, to say if somebody touched like a, a bill, we would tell them to wash their hands, whatever. You can imagine, you know, how that felt during the pandemic. Actually, that was the, the Central Bank of South Korea, I believe, burned literally, not, not conceptually, burned like millions of bills, um, of, of cash bills because of contamination. So um, evolving towards digital payments and contactless payments was a, a key piece for people to stay safe during the pandemic. And everything that, that you know, is around that ecosystem also helped people, people's lives during the, this period. And again, that's not coming back. Like people are not gonna say all of a sudden after the pandemic is over, yeah, I think I'm gonna you know, go to a bank branch today and waste my whole day like standing in a line there like to talk to someone that is gonna be uh, annoyed by my presence and, and fail to help me. You know yes absolutely absolutely that is great some great points but let me ask you you have grown faster than any other digital bank in the rest of the world what do you what do you think was made the difference I think besides that's... you being exceptional <laughs> um so listen i i think it, it it's a variety of factors and, and and a lot of things that feed on each other ultimately i think people grew to 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 love and trust us to trust the brand but we really believe like this this is Kellogg so I wouldn't I couldn't get away without talking some marketing today uh, but I, I don't think it's just about the, the the marketing right like we truly believe that the company is the culture is the brand is the product is, is, is this one thing and and when you try to do a lot of companies do that like they they write on the wall what the company values are, and then they, they write what the brand values are, and then they try to say something that they are like to the public, to their consumers, and they do, you know, very different things internally. And, and people see through that, like it's, it's schizophrenic, you know? And one of the things that we're able to always do was um, to know very clearly who we are, we were, what we stood for, and to live that very authentically. 
and to make sure that in all touch points, people could perceive that they could touch it, they could smell, they could, you know, taste it. Right. So I think that consistency over the years uh, that, of course, led to better products and more transparent communications and and all the things that we stand for and lower fees and or no fees would, you know, whatsoever, like all those things kind of added up, but they represent our essence, they represent our culture and, and ultimately people buy why you do something they don't buy what you do right yes yeah that's interesting and i see some question coming in i see one that says um does nubank seek to serve small to mid-sized businesses for example farmers in brazil in addition to individual consumers if so how have you expanded your product offering to meet their needs so right now we're serving micro and very small businesses in Brazil. Uh, we call them maize. So they're micro entrepreneurs. Um, they are sole owners of their own companies. And we have an account product. We have a debit card for them. We're about to uh, release a credit card for them. It's already in testing. So uh, we're essentially taking the, the consumer experience that we've built and taking it like, you know, expanding it adjacently to people that beyond being consumers are also um, micro companies of the business of their own, you know? So those are, um, I don't know, professionals, uh, lawyers, you know, people that have very small commerces or people that are personal trainers or uh, masseuse therapists, you know, like people that run as small businesses, they, they're not necessarily employed. And it's been very interesting to see them uh, leverage the depth of their relationship with us. Like we know that they're uh, better off uh, when, they, when they're allowed to, um, to, to access better tooling, to even manage their finances on both ends, on the, on the business end, as well as on the personal side. That's very interesting. And, and there's another question, which is just following what you were saying just before. It says, how do you, because you were talking about your culture, and it says, how do you foster that culture and let it evolve in alignment with your core values? Uh, I could speak for an hour on that, but but let me let me do the short version. So the short version is uh, culture. If you go and seek the, the you know the traditional definition, is about how people act and how they communicate and how they make decisions, right? And and that's something that will evolve over time naturally. Like we're not we don't communicate or make decisions or or, or you know go about our business in the same way that we do now with almost almost four thousand employees across six countries, you know. Uh, the same way that we did eight years ago when it was, you know, less than 10 of us in a small house, right? Uh, those things are going to evolve and are going to change over time. We try to focus on the things that cannot change. And those are, first, our purpose, the reason why we exist. And we're very uh, committed to that purpose. And the way that we state that is fight complexity to empower people. It's very broad, but we really believe in using the power of technology, of design, of good communication, good customer service to really strip down. By the way, new comes from, new means naked in Portuguese. So it actually comes down from stripping down all that complexity um, so that people can back can have back control over their lives. And that's a very broad purpose or reason to exist. And we got to stay true to that. And the other thing are our company values, which are the same from when we started a company eight years ago. Um, those five values are the things that we strive to live by, no matter how big we get, no matter how many different people we hire, to how many countries we expand. And here it says, um, how specifically does Nubank help these micro entrepreneurs navigate in their journey to start their usage of a credit card, a financial product that they probably had never had or never heard of? Oh, they heard of and they've had for the most part. So Brazil is, 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 is um, a fairly penetrated uh, country in terms of credit cards. Uh, we have tons of POS machines, like one for every, I don't know, maybe 10 inhabitants, you know, like uh, it's a fairly penetrated country. It's, it's more about um, having true access to credit in, in like um, in, a, in an affordable way. So interest rates for credit cards in Brazil are very high because losses are also very high. So it's like this vicious negative cycle that never ends because people don't, again, they're not super, financial education is a challenge everywhere, but especially here. 
uh, people lose track of their debts. And uh, I think that's more of the challenge. Um, and the way that we do is we, we start the relationship with those micro entrepreneurs on, again, on the consumer side, and we learn about their habits before we can decide to offer them um, a credit platform. That's very interesting. And I'll come back because there's so many questions of Nubank, mm -hmm. but I want to ask also a bit about you and your leadership and your career because, you know, uh, it's, it's so inspiring. And like in two, what I read is in 2013, you were working at a larger traditional bank, receiving well-paid, the biggest bonus, and, and then you quit and uh, founded the new bank. I'm sure that was a risky decision. Can you tell us how did you feel about it? How did you go about it? No, for sure. Um, it was one of the toughest decisions I had to make, for sure, like the toughest one up until that point in my life. Um, because as you said, like I had a good career and I was well paid and I was well evaluated and people knew me, I had a reputation, but at the same time, like I, I, I felt that I was failing miserably because I didn't believe in anything anymore. You know, I, I looked up to people above me, to men above me, which by the way, like, you know, there, there wasn't a single woman in a range of like miles. Um, and I, I. I thought to myself, the best case scenario is I become one of those guys. Like I'm, I really don't want to, don't want that path, you know, because those were people that all they did, you know, day in and day out was to get caught up in those political, you know, uh, plots internally, and and take care of their own personal agendas. Couldn't care less about customers. Couldn't care less about shareholders. All they cared was about their bonuses. It was something very sad to see, really. And um, I did my best. So, so I was with them for five years and I was lucky in a lot of ways in the sense that I was able to run different businesses where I could get away with doing some things that nobody noticed because the businesses weren't that big. But my last role there was running their largest credit card business. And for the best part of a year, I was telling them the, you know, the story that I believe, my thesis, by the way, when I started Nubank, that it just wasn't sustainable. It wasn't sustainable for us to sell less on a monthly basis than our churn because people hated the product. Because, and by the way, we, were, we weren't selling credit card. Like we were pushing it down people's throats, like through telemarketing, because, you know, it, those are just bad products. And I had this whole project of redesigning the product portfolio and, and completely changing the way that we did that. I had this genius, genius, Nobel Prize winning insight that if, if we could design a product that people actually wanted, it would be easier to sell it, you know? It was something okay, that came to me. You. No, you know, after, uh, when, I, when I had the first pilot ready, I had, you know, the car design ready, we were ready to go. And the, the senior VP, which was on track to be the next CEO, uh, told me that, you know, they didn't need that. They could just, you know, make up for the lost revenue with just creating another fee somewhere else. That was literally what I heard. And that day I decided I needed to quit that job, that it was just, it was just impossible and sustainable. I was, I was done making rich people richer. This is such a, an inspiring story. I have seen here a question. What has been your biggest challenge as an entrepreneur in Latin America? It, it always is people, always. Like it, it was in the beginning. It, it was until two years ago. It is today. It's going to continue to be. Um, for, for us to build something um, at this scale, and, and to have this level of impact and to go against like the type of competitors that we have. Like when, when we first started the company, people told me that they, they would attempt, like the, my competitors would attempt against my life, like that they would have to walk around with bodyguards, you know? Uh, it, banking, financial services was this sacred cow that nobody went against, you know? Nobody thought it was, well, this was eight years ago. Like the, the, the term FinTech didn't exist. The term unicorn didn't exist. Like people didn't think it was possible at all, right? So it was very hard to assemble the, 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 the first team, but we needed exceptional people. The mission is really challenging. The level of impact that we wanna have is really ambitious. We won't be able to get any close to that without a, an amazing team at a global scale. Like we needed a, you know, a world-class team, we still do. And, and you know, almost 4,000 people later, 
uh, it continues to be the biggest bottleneck. It's not capital, it's not uh, creativity, it's not technology. We're not limited by anything, only by the amount of people that we, we are able to hire at the level of the bar that we keep. That's incredible. Uh, I, I see several questions about you as a woman. So let me read one quote that you had. When I co-founded Nubank, I was determined to create a working environment without all the stupid barriers that are detrimental to women's career development. So when it came to breaking down these barriers, right, what was more challenges? What, what were the challenges you found and how did you go about it? I gotta say, they weren't. It's. I think the saddest thing about these barriers is that they're not even that hard to overcome once you want it. You know, let me let me name two. So at this previous job that I had at this incumbent bank, um, a, a few months before I left, I had received this remarkably useful feedback that um, I didn't look like my my superiors obvious reasons i wore dresses right like they wore suits right and and i had long hair and i was a woman and and they weren't right and i got this feedback and and despite all my good work that was the one thing you know that they needed to call me on and and they asked me to work on it right and as much as a protagonist as i've always been of my life and of my career i said you know what that's okay like if all i need is to wear suits every day sure you know, why not? So I went and and grabbed my suits and, and I went wearing them like every day. Sometimes it was pantsuits, sometimes it was just, you know, the skirt suits and and I wore them to work every day. And, and until this this one day, two months later, I got the positive feedback that now I was looking like them. You know, now they could see me getting continue to develop my career, which is completely like <laughs> it's insane. Can you imagine the amount of energy that people spend trying to look whatever way that, you know, they assume people want them to look or they were told that they needed to look? What the hell? In which way was that relevant to the work that I was doing? No way, right? So this was one thing. The other thing that drove me nuts was the lack of flexibility, you know? It was such a big taboo when, where in every place that I, that I worked, um, and that I knew people on, uh, just to, you know, if you have a doctor's appointment and you have to like excuse yourself and go and, and come back, or if you need to leave early because there's a, the, the cable guy is supposed to go to your home, you know, those things were insane. Like, why? And, and as women, like as, as a mother of two that I now am, like I know that having flexibility is much more important than actually working fewer hours you know it's, it's much more about being able to adjust your family's routine and to you know the, the schedules that you have like to be able to uh, uh to accommodate everyone's needs in your family and and that didn't make any sense to me so those were I, I i cannot even say that this was hard it was just something so obvious that when we started new bank like we didn't care about you know and and we we just gave people the freedom to come in as they were and and to bring their full selves to work and for them to to be on to think like owners and to manage their own schedules whenever they had to you know that's that that's amazing and, and so building on this experience right and what you had how did you uh go about creating you know diversity and inclusion within nubank that's another interesting story so um of course, uh, we're we're three founders of Nubank, um, and I'm 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 a woman, and and my two partners are not, uh, and they're straight, and they're white. So you would think that you know I was the one like carrying the flag and pounding on the thing, but but it wasn't really like they 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 knew that diversity and inclusion was extremely important from day one. Um, we all did. It wasn't something that I had to um, to sell them on. Quite the contrary. So David, who's our CEO. He, he, he found me and he found Ed, who's our other co-founder, and he sought us precisely because we were so different, precisely because we complemented each other, you know? Um, and we, we, th there's this, this story that we use since we started a company, since the very first day that we started working together six years, eight years ago, um, that we tell people, which is, if there are five folks, they all look the same, they all went to the same schools. They all worked for the same companies. 
the odds of them all bringing up the same ideas is pretty high. And then you don't need five of them. You just need one. You know, why are you wasting the other four slots on people that are going to come up with the same stuff? Why would you? Right. So I think that was always very clear to us that we needed that. Like, it's, it's not like we wanted because it was nice because no, we could not afford not having all the slots filled by people that would bring different perspectives that would make us better, you know, that would add their point of view to and, and that would bring up uh, insights that weren't uh, brought up before. Right. So naturally, just that belief in, in the, sure, the fact that I was there led us very far in terms of diversity and inclusion, like without any relevant effort, we grew the company to be over 40 percent female around 42, 43% uh, female, including leadership positions. So we have around 40% uh, of leadership positions occupied by women. We have um, almost 30% of the team identifying as, as part of the LGBT community, which is insane. Yeah. Um, we are, although far, far from ideal, but much better racially represented than the average tech company or financial services company, actually better than any. Uh, tech company or financial services company. Uh, and just now, only recently, uh, we, we did structure programs and, and initiatives around that to, to even push it further, right? So we have now a commitment to increase, uh, to get to gender uh, equity, actually, um, not later than 2025, probably before. That is going to include hiring um, 3,300 women over the next four years. We also have a commitment to increase, like to expand further uh, racial diversity at Nubank, which is going to include hiring over 2,000 uh, black and brown uh, Nubankers to join us over the next few years. So there are a lot of different initiatives in place, not just on hiring, but also on looking at all our people processes and eliminating biases from, from the different places that we're blindsided uh, to today. Uh, there are also educational programs that help you know, feed our pipeline with people that wouldn't have had that opportunity to educate themselves on tech, on design, on data science, whatever it is, uh, to come and work with us. So there are multiple initiatives now that are going to help us uh, go even further. That's great. I look forward to, to, to see all uh, you're doing. The, the, the questions are keep flooding in. So let me be, well, Christina, with the success of the Nubank model, to what extent are you leveraging learnings to drive investing or advising fintech opportunities throughout LATAM and even here in the US with immigrant communities that are underbanked and need remittances and services? Yeah, uh, we would love to do more of that, but we have our plates so full, you know, uh, we're like kids in, in a candy store, like I tell people, like, and, and, and not just us, like our customers too, like the, the, the very first day that a customer grabbed our first card and, and swiped it and, and made the first transaction, they were already asking us for an account, for a debit card, for a loan, for, you know, and we're not done providing those to them. Uh, and we've recently expanded into Mexico, into Colombia, and in those countries were barely starting with credit cards. So there's a ton to do. I'm sure we're going to get to those. Like remittances is a big opportunity, and and sure, like a lot of a lot of people uh, ask us if we can advise them, if we can invest. But the truth is, the day only has 24 hours. Like there's only so much that we can do, and our main focus is to serve our customers. So we 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 just try to focus on the most important things for them in the markets that we're already in. I have to tell you, there's, in fact, there is a serial question, like, when are you coming to the US? When are you coming to the EU? When are you coming to Colombia? We, so we get that a question a lot. We, we get those questions everywhere we go. I don't know, go figure. I, 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 what I can say is that the opportunity in Latin America in like developing economies is often bigger than you know in the US or in Europe. Yeah. Um, as bad as banks are, like they're not loved anywhere, but they're especially hated here, you know? Uh, the service isn't great. I know there's a ton of board. Like I lived in the state, so I know like it's not great, but it's not as nearly as bad as it is down here. So we we, we follow the pain, right? Like yeah, I can, uh, I can see that. Yeah, I can see that. Yes, and and if I see here a question. Um, from someone who says, I am a proud Nubank customer. Yeah. And say, <laughs> I love, I love seeing happy customers. Yes, I live for perfect. That. with a big smile here. Yeah. And then this is, how do you see the future of remote work at Nubank? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I don't think we're ever coming back to things as they were before the pandemic, you know? 
uh, to everyone waking up at the, around the same time, commuting to the same place, sitting right next to each other and doing their own work. You know, I, I, I don't see that happening again in the way that it was. Having said that, um, at Nubank, we, we are a company that is very collaboration oriented, I guess, much like Kellogg. Um, the, the unit of work is not the individual, is a team. You know, people are always a staff to a team, like collaborating, working together. The accomplishments are accomplishments of the teams and not of the individuals. So um, it's, 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 it's going to be tricky to find the right balance, you know, to, to allow people to, to collaborate, especially when we think about creative work. It's so much better to do it in person, so much better to be in the same room together. So I think the, 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 the trick is going to be able to, is going to be finding that balance, you know, of uh, continue to allow people to have the flexibility if they have individual work, if they have stuff that they need to do, code that they need to write or whatever that they can do from wherever they want. Uh, but to at the same time find the find the moments and the spaces and the rituals and the you know the times and the frequency for those teams to, to to work together because we we believe in that we believe there's there's value in that. Uh, you sound like a true Kellogg alumna. Me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, I see another question: Will there be any products or services for small and medium enterprises in the future? What do you think these businesses need to succeed? The future is a very broad concept. That's in the true. future, <laughs> sure, maybe, you know. In the near future, probably not. You know, we're going to continue to focus on consumer and the micro entrepreneurs and small, like very small businesses, just because, again, there's so much to do. And large companies, they're often better served. Like, they're not as 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 um as poorly treated as as consumers and, and micro entrepreneurs right so the pain is much smaller having said that there's always pain like there's always excess bureaucracy there's always like bad processes there's always yeah i would just say like if you're looking for opportunities look for the pain look for the problems and the world is filled with them yeah, yeah. and here this is christian do you think that traditional banks have any chance to compete with the dynamic of fintech and the quickness and the time to market they have to get right product to the customers? Uh, I think they're severely handicapped <laughs> by many factors from legacy technology and legacy platforms. They're horrible. They're full of bugs and full of, you know, uh, complexity, but not just that also culture, right? Like these are organizations that have been around for a century sometimes, right? Or at least to the very least of, you know, many decades. And they often have tens of thousands of employees and you don't go changing culture like that. It's an extremely hard process. So I think they, they have many obstacles to, to competing with that. Having said that, not all FinTech companies are Nubank, right? Like we have a lot of companies that, you know, cannot attract the level of talent that we do. They haven't been able to scale like we have, right? They haven't uh, been able to access funding like we did. Right, so it, it it is a hard business to compete on. So um, for the best of them, I think there there will still be room for them to 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 occupy some space. Like this is not a winner takes all type of industry, right? Yeah, that's very interesting. And here, that another one: what do consumers use personal loans for? Is there a lot of customer education needed to help them understand the products, or will they? accessing loans from informal lenders before coming to Nubank? I think the type of customers that we're serving with our lending business is not that type of customers that were like taking money from, you know, I, I don't know what's the word in English, uh, but we say agiotas in Portuguese, but anyway, like from shark lenders, you know? Oh, yes, like, yes. Um, I think for the most part, like they're often just, you know, regular bank customers uh, that, you know, would convenient would take convenience from an incumbent bank if they had an account there and they needed to get a loan but now they have an account with us and we just happen to to be able to better price that loan because uh or cost infrastructure is much small is much lighter you know and and we strive to reduce a lot of that complexity and to pass on those savings to customers in the form of no fees and lower rates um so, uh, and, and for the vast majority of them, they're going to use for the same things that, you know, customers 
use loans for, right? Like they, they might do some renovation in their homes. They might, um, you know, have some medical expense that they need to pay for, or they have some more expensive debt somewhere else that they need to uh, restructure. Yeah, it could be, yeah. yeah. Interesting. And here I have another one who says it's a user of a new, of new in uh, Mexico. I love the product. So you see. <laughs> And it says, from, from the investors in Nubank, what has differentiated good productive investors from those less so? Olha, listen, um, <laughs> we were able to choose our investors, to cherry pick them over the years, yeah. luckily. I mean, some luck, some merit, but we've always had more demand uh, from investors than, you know, we needed money. Actually, it's been two or three rounds that we've been raising. We, we, we didn't need the money. Of course, as you grow, you need more capital reserves if you're in the financial services business. Um, but it, we, we've been generating cash for almost four years now. So we're not burning cash. Um, and we, we, as you said, like we, there's no other company has done what we did uh, in Brazil, like worldwide, right? So we, we're lucky to today have on our cap table Sequoia Capital, DST, uh, uh, TCV, uh, Tiger, Founders Fund, like some of the some of the best, if not all of the best, uh, venture capital funds in the world. So, and they're all pretty, pretty great partners to us. I think we were. I guess what I'm trying to say is like we we screened the bad ones out before <laughs> yes. letting them in in a position of like you know seeing the bad ones behave after they they joined. And here one, would you talk about your strategy to scale the business? What were some of the critical hurdles that had to be overcome? So many. Um, I think David will agree, my partner, uh, he will agree that it was much harder to get Nubank from half a million customers to five million customers than it was like from getting from zero to half a million, you know, for sure. Um, because in the beginning, you, you can get away with doing a lot that doesn't scale, right? Because, and, and it's funny because that's also what the skeptics said, right? Like they were like, oh, of course it's easy for them to treat customers well when they have the, uh, you know, a hundred thousand customers. I wanna see when, by, by the time they get to a million, you know, and we, we, we got to a million, we got to two million, we got to five million, to 10, to 20, to 30 million. And at some point they're gonna shut up, but they're still thinking that, you know, it's easy for them because, you know, X, Y, Z, it's never easy. It's hard. It's extremely hard work. It hurts. And I, 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 I can't, I can't really name a strategy. Like it's, it's, it's almost surviving to scale, you know, like you do the best that you can for things uh, to grow and not break. And, and especially for us, like we, we're a pretty customer oriented company. Like we really want our, our number one company value says we want our customers to love us fanatically that's what it says ah, I love so that. it hurt so bad as we scaled whenever there was something that impacted customers right whenever we had a crash whenever there was a bug whenever so i i don't have a secret formula i think it comes down to having a clear picture of what's going on of where your bottlenecks are prioritizing them working really hard on them and that's it that's interesting. And here's one more also again about you. Great to see a successful female entrepreneur. How do you balance your professional career and new bank success with your young children? Well, I got to say it's challenging. It's, it's one of the things that I'm most proud of in my life, for sure, is, is the family that I've built. Um, one of the things that I, um, I like to say that it, it's about priorities. Right. Like I have two priorities in my life. It's my family and no bank, period. Like there's no hobby. There's no social circle. There's no uh, group of friends. There's no like travel. Like it's just it's that's all that I can handle, period. You know, I got to prioritize. I got to make choices. Right. Like I I'm not the fittest person. You know, uh, I got to say, like, I don't do a lot of sports. I don't like you gotta, you gotta make choices, you know, you've got to prioritize what's important for you. So I would say that's, that's the main thing. The second thing that I'll say helps a ton is just being disciplined about a routine, you know, and when, when you understand what needs to happen within your priorities. So 
with my children and I and my family, uh, it's been, you know, the, the, the routine of getting them to school and picking them up and dropping them off and making sure that, you know, uh, dinner was, was ready by the time they needed to eat because they needed to go to bed. Like, and, and, and designing my professional routine around my family's needs was, was something that helped a ton. You know, and enhance the flexibility point that we talked about earlier in our conversation. That's the most important thing. So I, I was lucky and privileged uh, to be able to have that flexibility and, and to be able to prioritize my, 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 my family routine and to adjust that to my, to my work routine. That's, that's, that's very important. And, uh, and, and by the way, let me, let me just add one more yes. thing because I cannot Sorry. be unfair. My husband, right? Like he plays a big role too. Of course. Uh, I think we always talk about that and, and we, we, we ask of women a lot of how they do that, but we never ask the man. And uh, my husband is a big partner and he does a ton. Like I have a one-year-old, a baby that was born like just in the beginning of the pandemic. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And every day when she wakes up, usually before 6 a.m., he's the one that gets up. You know, he's the one that picks her up and, and changes the diaper and feeds her in the morning and stays with her until like I'm up and I'm dressed. And, you know, so we we do share a lot of the responsibility around here. And that's a that's a key thing. I think Shel Sandberg said it best. Uh, the number one most important decision that you're going to make in terms of your your career and your family life is going to be who you marry, who's, who your partner is. So I got to I got to I got to say that. <laughs> completely agree completely agree great message and given we are talking about you right and you are a Kellogg alumna I just wanted to ask you how did the Kellogg help you to prepare you as an entrepreneur or someone to be willing to take big risks like you did that's a good question I don't think I've taken a lot of time to reflect on that over the years because everything happened so fast I'll give you this um Kellogg sure helped me um Help, helped open a lot of doors for me, right? So it helped me land my job out of business school, of, of course, which uh, was a transit. I was coming uh, from consulting. So I was with BCG for a few years before business school. And I was coming from consulting and transitioning into an executive role. And being able to, to make that transition successfully was for sure key on everything that I went on to do afterwards, right? Because I came out of business school, I was I was 25 when I graduated. I was very young and I was um, offered a position um, a, 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 like a senior management position at this incumbent bank, uh, managing a team of 40 with three managers reporting to me. And the youngest analyst was like 26, like he was older than I was. <laughs> so uh, having that foundation to to help me learn that business, which I didn't know, and, and to properly um, lead that team and to manage that team as well uh, was was super important. And of course, that that put me on a, on a, you know, a positive trajectory to go and take on more responsibility and learn a little bit more. Uh, and it also gave me confidence uh, by the time I decided to quit my job that better things would come up, you know, that I would be able to find something that was a much better use of my time for the next decade of my life. Um, and then, of course, by the time I met my, my co-founder, my, my partner, David, um, that credential was important. It played a role. He knew that, you know, hiring someone that had been to Kellogg was a little bit of an insurance policy that that person had um, enough knowledge, enough, uh, you know, uh, social skills, uh, enough collaboration skills and, and so on to be able to, um, um, to make this work. So. I think over the years, there are multiple instances in which this has manifested, but I'm, I'm sure that it was a, an, a very key piece of my trajectory that helped open many doors in the future. It's great to hear because what I like to tell people is that we plant seeds in, in the student's mind and they can happen later in life, right? And that's exactly what you're talking, which is a great great story i see another message here. how would you how would you inspire high school girls and college women to study finance we need more women in finance we do but i don't know if i would inspire them to go into finance yeah uh, but, okay let me, <laughs> let me we we certainly do need more women in finance but um it's funny that uh, somebody asked that because a couple weeks ago i i spoke for um um i spoke to a class of princeton grads undergrads mm -hmm. all all women by the way 
in a course that is taught by a, a Nubank board member who is a woman um, um, and a PhD. Um, and she teach, teaches a Princeton um, um, a class, a, specific, a program that is designed for uh, female undergrads to find their path like into the business world. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful uh, course. And, and she invited me in, in, and of course I, I was happy to, um, uh, to help her and, and to, to talk to those, to those women. Um, in my opinion, I think we more than in finance, I think we need women in tech. And the reason why I say that is because if you fast forward, you know, the, 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 the movie, they were all in enough into the future, everything software is eating the world, right? Like there's a famous quote and every, every company is bound to become a tech company or die, right? Like eventually, yes. uh, this, this digital nativeness is gonna embed everything that we do, even the most remote industries, right? So I think that's a much better um, way to include women into creating the future that we're all gonna live in. And ultimately, it doesn't matter if it's finance, if it's agriculture, if it's healthcare, right? It's, it's, it's all technology, like that's, the, that's the, the, the same common ground that we all share. And, and that's, those are the tools that will build the future that we're going to live in. So I would rather aim for that, la that structural layer that is tech versus for specific industries. I, I love that. I'm going to try to promote that. That's, a, that's actually great. That's actually a great message. I can see how it can really huge impact. Now here, I, I have to tell you, I'm getting inundated from question. I'm already apologizing to everybody. I will never be able to get through all this question, but let me get another one. What key quality do you look for when adding people to your team? Great question. Great question. <laughs> I love that question because it gives, me, um, it gives me the opportunity to talk about some of the things that I've learned over the years. So first of all, one of the things that I care the least about is um, industry experience, right? It matters here and there for some teams um, where, you know, that could speed up the, the learning curve. But for the most part, especially when you're trying to do something different, it, it takes a lot of time for somebody to unlearn what they've learned in the industry and then so that they can learn what is it that you're trying to do. So it's often a waste of time. Uh, in addition to that, I, I think all those things that are specific, like they can be taught. I try to try hire more um, for like the the raw skills, and one of the, the the skills that I that I look for the most is like learning agility. Is one's ability to learn a lot and learn really fast, because even after you've learned and after you've onboarded and you work at a company, the world changes. There, there's new information and things go obsolete and, and new stuff comes in and there's new technology and you got to adapt because, you know, somebody did something and customers changed their mind, whatever it is. So you, I think that mindset, the growth mindset is a key thing for me, for sure. And the other thing, um, and, and that's, that's another quote that I, that I love. Uh, I tell people that um, I can teach them anything, but I can't teach them, teach them how to give a shit, you know? So I, I, I need to hire people that care, that give them, you know? That cannot be taught. Like, you, you, someone can be six months, a year into the job and, and ultimately come to the conclusion that they just, they just don't care enough about what is it that they're doing. So care, like, that, that angle for me is, is very very important. I, I love that. And I have to tell you, this is exactly, you know, you, I have to tell you these things. What I love of Kellogg is when I talk to Kellogg alumni and, and like you, they talk and you look so much of the values that we have in mm -hmm. Kellogg. And I feel like, oh, and see? I haven't told her, I haven't told you, say this. Or that. That's, you're such a yeah. thing what we, we are saying, and it's a yeah. great uh, message of values. Yeah, the, the, I have to say, you struck a chord before about when talking about leaving a bank for a, uh, for a business, because there's so many questions about that and the risk, and there's someone that's asking, can you please elaborate a little more? What was your backup in your mind? If you can go back sure. to talking about that. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, so here's the situation. I knew I didn't want to stay there, right? And I looked up. I didn't see anyone that you know remotely inspired me or that I could learn from. Quite the contrary. I suspected that if I stayed on, I would just get dumber, right? Because I, I actually had a conversation with my boss back then saying, listen, like, this is what you need from me. Like, put a cone in my place. Like, you don't need me to do this. Like, I, I, I want to do more and, and, and they wouldn't let me, right? So that decision was clear. And then I had a couple of choices. I could just, you know, keep doing the job until something better came up. But gladly and luckily, I was at a point in my life, my husband and I, our family, like we, we had enough money saved that we didn't depend on my like monthly salary to pay the bills on a monthly basis. And I could afford to quit because what I really wanted was to be super strategic about my next move. I wanted to carefully, carefully select what I was going to do with the next five to 10 years of my life. I wanted to maximize the impact that I would have, you know? And I tell people that I almost like went to business school again, because what I did was I quit and I gave myself like three to four months to de decide what I wanted to do. And then I would start like searching for it and, you know, and, and eventually do it. it. It didn't take that long. Like within two months, I, I was doing uh, no bank, but during those two months, I worked extremely hard. I was up before, like I was in my computer, like before 7 a.m. and often until like 11 p.m. or midnight every day reading, talking to people. I, I read 10 books in two months. I watched tens of TED Talks. I, I, I read hundreds of articles. I did everything that I could think of. Like I talked to tens of people in my network, just trying to get to understand. Like I did a lot of soul searching. I did a lot of those exercises that coaches often do, like, you know, try to think about your strengths and whatever. I took the Hogan, I took the disc, I took a bunch of like those tests. But I, I did a lot of research to, to really understand which path was going to lead me to maximize the impact that I was searching for. And by the time I, 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 I met my, my, my partner, I had other offers on the table. And this was by far the riskiest, the scariest, the, um, the hardest, most challenging, the one that had the, 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 the worst financial um impact for me in the short term like I, I i i put money out of my own pocket i didn't get a salary for a very long time you know um but i knew i had to do it you know i i had such confidence in the the path towards doing something different and ultimately what i thought was if everything goes to hell like if nothing works and if a year from now like we're left with nothing I'll still have learned so much and that will have so much value that I'm still going to be able to find another path that is going to be interesting and rewarding. So I'm willing to invest, like to, to pay this tuition, so to speak, you know, for, for a year um, to see where this is going to take me. So that was, I hope this is helpful, but, but that was the thing. Yeah. Well, I was thinking, I hope some of the people listening today would be inspired by that because it's a, it's a very powerful message. I, we are running out of time. I'll ask you one more question because there's several also going back to your point about culture, values, products. You were talking about alignment of these. It says, have you ever faced a challenge to that alignment of culture, values, products? And how have you dealt with that challenge? I think it depends on the level of granularity that you want to go because in some ways like we face challenges like that every day and that's how we see that we're living by our values or not you know that's how we're tested on a daily basis uh there have been like bigger moments or smaller moments but i'll i'll i'll, I'll name one um there was a brief moment in which we we were looking at our delinquency rates or payment ratios of the credit card product and we noticed that all of a sudden a larger number of customers were not paying their bills on time. And we looked everywhere for signs of, you know, increased delinquency or unemployment rates or trying to explain, like, is this getting worse from a credit standpoint? And it wasn't. By the way, these customers were like, just, just later for a few days and then they would pay in full. So there was like no worsening from a risk standpoint. And we were there like kind of scratching our hands until we figured we figured like there was some, some, some code change rolled into production that led to a bug 
that inhibited one reminder for these customers of the bill payment. And, you know, more customers were not paying on time. And it would say, well, that's, that's interesting and also a pretty good deal because, you know, if customers are getting late, you're getting more interest revenue and late fees um, and, and the delinquency rates are not going up. That's, that's a great bargain, right? Like, because you're improving your PL numbers and, and without any, any additional risk. But the, there wasn't even a debate. Like we went back and, and turned the reminder back on, like immediately, you know, because we knew that was not what we meant for customers, right? Like we, we didn't, we didn't meant to trick them into like, we, we didn't send them more reminders because we, we think it would annoy them. Like a lot of people get annoyed. They're like, okay, okay, I know, like I'll pay. Like, the, you know, it's like you're collecting from me before I even paid. So we, we tested giving them more reminders in the past, even like we're, we're not trying to make money when customers fail. You know, when customers get like slip a payment or get tricked, right? And and we knew that was a, a you know something very true uh, about what we stood for and who we are we were. So there the, there wasn't a debate. We just immediately turned it on and then continued with our lives. So I think those small things test us every day, and th those are the true measures to which we're living up to to our values. That actually is a great story to end, and like it's exactly it, ju it just testifies how you know it, it's not just the general things, but the, the small things like this when one sees uh, the real uh, commitment uh, to values. Uh, Christina or Chris, I have to say, uh, I, it's, it's been such a delight this conversation. I learned so much. I really hope everybody here has been inspired as I've been. Um, I really think you're such a role model for everybody and especially for our students. Thank you for being with us uh, today uh, and everybody connected. Thank you for connecting our, uh, this is Kellogg series with a focus of entrepreneurship uh, will continue, but it was great to see such a great Kellogg alumna. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, thank you. And um, allow me to grab the last minute here to, to do my own merchandise. Yes. On, on the hiring front, like we're hiring like crazy for every geo that we're in. Um, we uh, have a lot of openings in multiple uh, functions uh, in the company. Actually, we we even have appetite to take some summer interns. So if, if you know, people are interested for M&A team, we have a couple of openings there. Um, so if, you, if you're interested in, in, in working at Nubank, please reach out to us. We have a careers page. Feel free to send us a message there. Find a way to get through to us. Um, we have a world-class uh, team everywhere, and uh, we should be so lucky to have more Kellogg talent into, into Nubank. I we have a quite a few. Them all. I have to say, <laughs> after, uh, after uh, listening to you, if I didn't have to run this place, I would come myself. See? <laughs> See? There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Great role really modeling. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, All right. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. So you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.